what are the duties of a trustee or a governing board member? One of the first things that I ask, whether you are in a trust society or a company, acquaint yourself with the aims and objects, rules and regulations and work within that framework. What do I mean by this? Every organization has with itself what is called a charter. In a trust, it is called a trust deed. In a society or a company, it is called memorandum and articles of association. In a random check that I always do, I ask people, do you have a charter? Oh yes, we have it. Where is it? Safely locked. Very good. All original documents must be safely locked. Have you ever read it? No, I have not read it. It happens. There are people I know who have served on their boards or as senior executives for 10 years, <coughs> 15 years. They have heard of a document called trust deed or memorandum, but they never read it. So the point is keep your originals very safe in the safe deposit locker or wherever you are keeping it in the cupboard. But there is certain thing called photocopying, Xerox. Just make copies of every board member should have a copy of the charter. Every senior executive should and in your lifetime read the document entirely at least once. It's a mandatory requirement because you should know what your own charter wants you to do. What are the aims and objectives? What are your powers? What are your duties? What are your obligations? Your own charter will tell you that first. Second thing is to oversee accounts, particularly the cash book, petty cash book, ledgers, everything. Here the issue is of oversight. I mean, I'm not saying the trustee himself should sit down and write the cash book and the ledger, but oversee that these things are done. Oftentimes the cash book is written but never posted to the ledger. Vouchers are maintained, but there is no authorization. There are no attached uh, uh, specifics to that. <coughs> in fact, to start up organizations in this audience, the fundamental of good finance keeping is a good vouching system and a good receipt system. Mandatory. It may seem very elementary to the bigger organization, older, or, but for the startups, this is the foundation of good finance keeping. Every time money goes out of your organization, make a voucher. Somebody has been reimbursed for travel, make a voucher. And somebody has to authorize it. So there is a number to the voucher, there is a date to the voucher, details are given and attachments. Supposing you have given somebody a travel reimbursement. Somebody had to travel to Delhi to meet somebody at the home ministry regarding FCRA. You have to first decide by policy, are you going to fly that person or send that person by train? That is a policy, no one is first on that. If you have decided you fly, it's fine. An e-ticket is generated, that is not good enough. With that you nowadays accounting standards require, you have to have attach the boarding pass also. Because e-ticket anybody can generate. The boarding pass confirms that you actually undertook the travel. And somebody has to authorize that. So every time money is given, given to somebody to buy 10 notepads, given, uh, I mean, so it may be petty cash or whatever, every time money goes out, a voucher is made, which is numbered, dated, details and attachments. And every time money comes into your organization, a receipt is made or a cash memo. <coughs> donation has come, make a receipt. Again, the receipt has a number, it has a date and details. So it's a donation, it's a sale of your product, it's a rent that has come, it's a membership fee that has come, a receipt or a, or a sale of your product. If you maintain numbered, dated, detailed vouchers and receipts, <coughs> even if you have a part-time accountant, who writes your accounts once a month for a few days, you will still manage it. So a startup organization need not even have a full-time accountant. If you will manage your vouching as it properly filed, the moment there is a money gone out, make a voucher there and then and file it with the date and number. Money has come, immediately make a receipt and it has a date and a number and details. Then even if this sits with you for one month and an accountant comes, just submit, a good accountant will take it to the cash book post it to the ledger and your books of accounts can be maintained. It's an absolute fundamental of finance keeping. And this, a board member has to oversee that it is done. Because end of the day, the buck stops with the trustees. The responsibility is of the trustee. So anything goes around, you can say the accountant goofed. The trustees are liable for that. Then ensure separate books of accounts if the trust has any business income or you receive foreign aid. So under FCRA, you need to have a separate cash book and a separate ledger for your FCR account. Only foreign receipts and its disbursement. This is a requirement under law. Vouchers must be maintained, as I said, cash memos, etc. Investment in accordance with Section 11.5. As I told you, you cannot invest in shares and stocks, nor in mutual funds where Maharashtra is concerned. Only certain approved mutual funds are there. 
If the trust operates in more than one region with regular branch offices, the accounts of all such branches should be consolidated or separate accounts should be maintained. Supposing you are headquartered in Bombay, but you have activities in Nasik, in Pune, in Sholapur, wherever else, and there's a lot of fundraising even going on over there and spending, make sure this all gets integrated into your main account. Failing which, if your branch offices become too big, then follow the model of what in the corporate world is called franchising. In the non-profit world, we call them affiliates. So you become the parent body, which is the hub, and everyone else who is working outside your area are separately registered. They have their own separate registration. They have their own boards of trustees. But to enjoy your brand name and logo, they pay you an affiliation fee. They report to you every year, and you have a certain MOU with them that you will enjoy the brand name and the logo only as long as you follow the norms which are laid down under the MOU. Classic cases are organization like National Association for the Blind, NAB, where you know the main hub is in Bombay, but there is a separately registered NAB in Hyderabad or in Bangalore. They have their own boards there, their own fundraising, their own accounts are filed. But to enjoy the brand name NAB and the logo, there must be an affiliation fee every year, send them reports, send them the annual financials, so on and so forth. So you can have, in the corporate world, they call it the franchising system. In ours, we call it an affiliate system. And keep an eye on cash flow, drop half yearly budgets if necessary. In Maharashtra state, filing a budget with the charity commissioner is a requirement under law. So before March, you have to file a budget. Of course, no one really verifies the uh, things over there, but it's a requirement to file a budget with the charity commissioner. It is not there in other states where charity commissioner is not there. All major policy decisions should be supported by resolution, pass either by circular or at board meetings. Sometimes you have to pass resolutions in a hurry. Let's say you want to make an investment or open a bank account. Now for those simple things, you need not call an entire board meeting. So you can pass it through circular. The requirement is any circular resolutions must be ratified at a duly convened board meeting. That's a requirement. Minutes books should be maintained. Minutes can be, in the old days, we used to handwrite it. Nowadays, you can even computerize it, but in an ideal situation, it is best that they are, any printouts that you take are stuck in a register, uh, because this is to avoid tampering. So basically, a minutes book is a basic register which is bound and numbered, so every page. So you can stick it there and the person partly signs on the register and partly on the page that is stuck. This is to avoid any tampering, because many people maintain minutes just in files. Now when you do that, it is also open to a lot of tampering. Okay, let's, I mean, one year later you decide that this was not such a good resolution, you pull that out and replace it with something else. So it's not good governance practice. It works for some, it uh, doesn't work for some. A good practice is to paste it or handwrite it, if you like, in your minutes book. And minutes need not be essays. I've seen minutes of meetings in some cases where there are long essays that are written. <laughs> you can even have bullet points. I mean, the key issues and ideal minutes today are three columns, you know, issue, Decision taken and ATR against that, action taken report. At the next meeting when you are confirming the minutes, you will also see your ATR. What is the action on the decision? So it was decided so and so has been delegated to find out about this. Has the action been taken? So it gets immediately. So basically you can do it even in column form. So you can even maintain Excel sheets for mere minutes or you can just draw columns in a Word document. There is really no hard and fast position under law in this regard. And all trustees are jointly and severally responsible in a trust. We have a concept of a managing trustee or an executive trustee, but under law there is no definition of a managing trustee or an executive trustee. This is for your own convenience. In a society you do have a president, secretary who makes the agenda, etc., a treasurer who looks after, uh, or rather oversees accounts, but in a trust there is no such portfolio. All the trustees are supposed to be jointly and severally responsible. So this is the position under law. Uh, so managing trustee is there by your convenience. You decide to have somebody, but otherwise it's joint and several responsibility.